So welcome to part two of this uh, webinar uh, on infectious diseases, part of the preventative health series uh, for Rabbit Awareness Week. So the two diseases that we're really going to talk about, or the two um, uh, viruses of which there are two types of the second virus um, that we're going to talk about are myxomatosis and viral hemorrhagic disease, rabbit viral hemorrhagic disease one and two. So the first one is the one that's been around for longer, uh, longest. This is myxomatosis. And um, this we've had vaccines for for a while. And they've been of mixed, um, uh, mixed usefulness. There have been older vaccines which are required to, to be given every six months with an intradermal component, uh, which is a bit fiddly, a bit um, uh, uh, tricksy to do. And uh, obviously required seeing the rabbit twice a year, which some owners were more or less uh, keen on. Some rabbits were more or less keen on. Um, but we now have a, a good, effective myxomatosis vaccine, which also covers against rabbit viral hemorrhagic disease 1, which was the only one that was out there uh, in the wild at the time. So this is a, a recombinant DNA vaccine. We can vaccinate from about five weeks of age, and it requires an annual booster. It doesn't contain any protection against RHD2, which we'll be coming to shortly. Myxomatosis um, has an incubation period of about 10 days, depending on uh, what sort of uh, what you take the, the first signs of uh, clinical manifestation of the virus to be. We'll see some uh, development of, of um, eye lesions from about three, day three to five, um, but really sort of full-blown myxomatosis is, uh, is present there within about uh, 10 days. It is possible to quarantine these rabbits, uh, to get them into quarantine before they're potentially infectious and to keep them in quarantine for a period of time up to when we can be reasonably certain that they're, uh, they're clear of um, uh, disease. Unfortunately, very often what happens is by the time people notice clinical signs of disease in one rabbit, it's too late to start thinking about vaccinating the other rabbits in the group. And so, as with all of these uh, diseases, prevention is very much better than cure. And even if you're not seeing myxomatosis in a particular area, or the owner feels it's not necessary to vaccinate against myxomatosis because they live uh, in, as indoor rabbits, uh, or even indoor rabbits in you know, an apartment building, a flat, um, many stories above the ground, they're still potentially at risk, as we'll discover. Various testing and screening tests can be performed and are commercially available. They're out there really for the lab animal field uh, for specific pathogen-free rabbit requirements for testing uh, to uh, screen animals that are coming into a big collection. They are commercially available, but um, it's dubious as to how useful they are in a clinical setting where manifestation of disease is going to occur and tell you what's going on fairly quickly, uh, possibly even before the results come back. So vaccination is part of the preventative healthcare strategy, but uh, we can also do a lot without vaccination, or we can do a lot to, to add a levels of safety uh, on top of vaccinated rabbits. Remember that not all rabbits respond to vaccination, and there's a lot of immune suppressed rabbits out there with chronic disease problems. So any other measures you can take are going to be helpful. And if people are particularly worried about uh, young rabbits or they're particularly worried about rabbits which they don't feel for health reasons can be vaccinated, then biosecurity and prevention of fomites uh, and insects uh, are the, the key things to do. But they're worthwhile doing anyway, just as a belt and braces approach. Probably the first thing to do is, is keeping insects and other arthro um, uh, invertebrates away from uh, uh, your pet rabbits. Note that um, we're predominantly worried about the rabbit flea. This is the main uh, vector of uh, uh, myxomatosis. It's the one that hops from rabbit ear to rabbit ear and potentially spreads myxomatosis by, uh, by biting uh, into the naive young uh, or you know, fresh rabbits. That can be spread directly from contact between uh, affected rabbits, so it's going to occur within a group. It's going to occur potentially if you've got wild rabbits coming up to one, one side of the fence, one side of the, uh, the hedge, and you've got uh, other rabbits, uh, domestic rabbits free in the garden, coming up to the other side, or wild rabbits get into your garden and uh, investigate the domestic rabbits through the mesh, so you know, the fleas can jump across. Rabbits can sneeze in each other's faces and they can spread it that way, but it, um, it's relatively more commonly spread by biting insects. 
We also need to worry about non-flying, uh, uh, sorry, flying insects as well as the uh, the fleas and such like. Uh, we need to worry about midges and mosquitoes flying in the open windows of um, uh, houses and uh, and flats and so on. So even if those rabbits are completely indoor rabbits, they still are potentially at risk. Remember that rabbit fleas don't necessarily need to hop from rabbit to rabbit directly. It's not uncommon for hunting cats uh, to go out in the um, spring and summer and bring back particularly baby rabbits, which are often absolutely hooching with, uh, with rabbit fleas. So you may find that the, uh, the cat actually drags a uh, uh, living or dead wild rabbit into the house and potentially spreads um, infection to any house rabbits or rabbits that's come into contact with in the garden. And it's possible the cat itself gets fleas from the rabbit. And um, we'll see these little stick type fleas, these little rabbit fleas around the edge of the rabbit's uh, of the cat's ear typically, and they can just be removed with a, uh, a uh, a cat safe uh, insecticide or uh, a drop of uh, fipronil on a piece of cotton uh, cotton wool or something dabbed onto the uh, uh, the individual fleas. However, to prevent further spread, we can also look at some form of fly screen or mesh. The problem with this is if you're using it uh, around a hutch or um, uh, or similar kind of outdoor uh, place that rabbits are living, it's possible to dramatically cut down on ventilation. And these are typically infections of the um, of the summer months and the autumn months when things tend to be a bit stuffy and humid and hot anyway. So if we decrease ventilation, we decrease airflow. We're both tending to encourage stagnant buildup of stale air, which is not so good for respiration, and um, we're potentially raising the temperature in these environments and so on. So fly screens are good, but you've got to be very mindful of the effect that's going to have on airflow and such like for respiratory tract health. We can think about insecticides uh, on the rabbit, either preventative, um, uh, sorry, uh, repellent type insecticides that are designed to deter fleas uh, from uh, coming onto the rabbit, from flying insects uh, landing on the rabbit. So we can use things like the pyrethroids um, safely in rabbits, but obviously we have to be very, very careful if we're uh, if there's any contact between cats and rabbits and making sure that owners don't confuse the two uh, two products. Likewise, the other way around, if they're using fipronil-based products on their cats, they need to be very careful they're not uh, using those on the rabbits so it's not getting onto the rabbits through contact because fipronil can be cardiotoxic to, uh, to rabbits. We can also use um, environmental insecticides. We can use uh, products to deter or kill insects flying near hutches and so on. Uh, anything from uh, um, sort of uh, chemical-based um, uh, medical um, grade sort of insecticides to uh, deterrent plants, deterrent candles, deterrent um, uh, um, vaporizers and so on with citronella type products in can be used. Also worthwhile thinking about the local uh, reproduction of biting insects. Certainly um, you can help to control and help to cut down the number of biting insects by draining standing water, by uh, covering standing water and by using things like Bacillus thuringiensis as um, biological control agents to kill mosquito larvae. So making sure that water butts are closed, that they perhaps have a, a drop of oil or a few drops of oil on top to form a film on top to uh, uh, to um, suffocate mosquito larvae using bacterial based um, uh, control measures or um, or just not leaving them uh, stand uh, full of water to provide a, uh, an environment for mosquitoes to uh, develop can all be useful. Then we're also talking in this about VHD 1 and 2. Now, um, myxomatosis has been around for uh, years, decades, almost a century. In fact, it was found in uh, um, Uruguay to affect European rabbits that were present there for laboratory uh, testing purposes because it had, immune, it had um, uh, co-adapted to living with the South American species of rabbit, the little cottontail rabbits, quite nicely and didn't cause them any significant problems. As soon as uh, European rabbits were exposed to it, however, they uh, uh, they died uh, very rapidly, and um, uh, it was um, <coughs> it was acutely fatal to to the European species. That was then exported from Uruguay, exported from South America, and used as biological control agent in the UK and uh, subsequently in Australia, where rabbits have been introduced by uh, People for Sport. So myxomatosis um, has been around for ages and a level of immunity has developed in the wild rabbit population and deaths kind of fluctuate, you know, there are good years and bad years probably based on insect numbers, but there is a background level of immunity which keeps the wild rabbit population alive. 
in the past couple of decades or so, rabbit viral hemorrhagic disease, one a completely separate um, uh, disease, a Khaleesi virus, Khaleesi virus, uh, first popped up in China in commercial rabbit farms and spread relentlessly through um, Asia, through uh, Europe, and um, has certainly turned up on island nations like the UK and so on. It does this because it's not spread predominantly by biting insects or anything. It's spread by uh, uh, fomites, it's spread by non-organic material uh, on which it survives for quite a decent length of time. So the ubiquity of shipping containers has probably been one of the main factors allowing uh, diseases to, to spread around the globe. And uh, this is one that does very well spreading that way because um, it tends to persist in the environment quite nicely. So VHD1 has been around in the UK for uh, about 15 years now and was present in the wild population to a small degree but possibly not as much as we originally feared because um, rabbits in the wild have got some protection uh, conferred to them by coexistence with European brown hares which had a European brown hare disease virus, a, a Kalichi virus, which perhaps offered them some cross protection. So they were essentially slightly vaccinated against VHD1. Interestingly and um, uh, un unfortunately, very unfortunately, it seems that hares are susceptible to VHD2 and we're seeing uh, confirmed cases of um, rabbit viral hemorrhagic disease to affected hares. So unfortunately it's gone the opposite way and caused um, mortality incidents for them. VHD1 um, is a vaccine that we've, uh, is a disease that's been vaccinated against in combination with mixed mitosis for a few years now, but that's vaccine pre, uh, predates VHD2 and so when we saw VHD2 appearing uh, coming as a, um, uh, as a mutation of the, vac uh, of the, uh, the virus in uh, France and Italy and so on, it was first identified in France and has now spread throughout continental Europe and to, to the UK and outlying islands, um, <clears throat> we see VHD2 um, uh, affect these, these species. Now, VHD2 was not covered in the Mixi RHD1 virus um, vaccine, and so we've um, imported various different vaccines, and we now have two licensed vaccines in the country uh, which protect against VHD2. We have Filovac, made by Filovi, um, dis uh, distributed by Siva, and we have Aerovac, made by Hipra. And the important take-home message is that all rabbits really should be, really must be vaccinated against VHD2, as well as VHD1 and um, mixo, uh, mixomatosis. And there are two vaccines available, and we suggest you uh, uh, source whichever vaccine uh, suits your, your needs best and uh, uh, disseminate that information to your clients and make sure those rabbits are uh, being vaccinated out there. So looking at the final V product, um, <coughs> uh, we see um, this um, <coughs> This vaccine, it's important. It does have a slightly um, a sort of murky appearance. It does have um, uh, quite a, a rich sediment comport, uh, component to it, and it does need shaking well and um, uh, the sediment distributing widely throughout the um, uh, throughout the vaccine. And all of that material needs to be administered. This isn't something that should be left behind in the vial. It's um, it's part of the the vaccine needs to be given. So we have that vaccine. That covers VHD1 and 2. Now we're seeing less VHD1 these days in the wild rabbit population uh, all the, uh, and the domestic rabbit population. All the PCR tests that have been done recently in the past couple of years or so have come back negative for RHD1. But um, whilst it appears that RHD2 is a, is a better virus, it's outcompeting RHD1 in its host, uh, it, uh, it doesn't matter we give uh, coverage against that as well. It's not going to over vaccinate the rabbit having a vaccine against mix and RHD1 and RHD1 and 2. So it's not going to do the rabbit any harm. We alternatively have Aerovac made by Hipra and this contains uh, only RHD2, uh, only that, uh, that vaccine component. And again, uh, this, uh, this vaccine should be administered uh, alongside um, together with uh, mixed mitosis RHD. When I say together with, the general advice uh, regarding immunological products is not to give them uh, to the same animal at the same time, uh, but to space them out by about two weeks. And that's um, sort of generic advice uh, based on the fact that these vaccines haven't been licensed, haven't been tested for use together, and is the, the kind of fallback position that you should be adopting. In certain cases, you may 
decide to vaccinate uh, rabbits uh, on the same visit if perhaps they're rescue rabbits and there is a limited window of um, vaccination opportunity or the rabbit becomes profoundly stressed by coming into the practice you may decide off license um, with informed consent from the owner to give those uh, two vaccines together but the important thing in that case is they're not given in the same site and they're not given in the same vaccination uh, syringe especially if you're using an oil based or water in oil in water based vaccine such as the um, Aerovac from Hipra. Take home message is vaccinate all the rabbits you want to live, basically. Um, choose a VHD2 vaccine and give that alongside the Mixo RHD uh, vaccine uh, made by uh, MSD. And um, this is something that we, we see pop up from time to time all over the country uh, in places where it hasn't been before. So past lack of exposure to the virus, past lack of awareness in the locality of the virus does not mean that uh, uh, your area doesn't have it, it just means you haven't had it yet. And um, we certainly see the virus popping up in some very unexpected places, places which don't even have rabbits, such as scoma, where we think it's probably been spread by the digestive tract of uh, predatory birds. And that, uh, that kind of explains, it kind of illustrates how, um, uh, how persistent in the environment and especially in organic products the, uh, the virus can be. With regard to biosecurity, um, insects are not the main method of transport, if, if, if they're a method of transport at all. We need to worry about uh, really uh, new animals being moved around the country for showing, for selling, uh, for um, uh, the pet trade, etc. And we need to worry about people and potentially animals mixing with uh, rabbits of different, bi uh, of different origins and potentially spreading it within uh, uh, collections and so on, or from collection to collection. So going to a rabbit show, going to a pet shop um, and bringing back the virus on your clothes, uh, particularly your, your feet, going for a walk in the countryside and walking around where uh, wild rabbits have, uh, have been, have been infected and been shedding the virus in large quantities in feces and, uh, and urine into the wild and potentially tracking that in on your feet. As I mentioned, it pops up from time to time. Um, we, we still are giving the advice that um, all rabbits should be vaccinated, even if they're indoor rabbits, they're at risk, even if they're um, uh, rabbits which um, have been vaccinated against uh, RHD1 and myxomatosis, they're at risk. And it's still occurring that uh, people are unaware of uh, how prevalent this disease uh, is and uh, what the risks are. This is a potentially fatal disease. RHD1 killed about 100% of the rabbits that were over 10 weeks of age. Uh, rabbit viral hemorrhagic disease 2 seems to kill a, a smaller number of rabbits, but um, seems to not spare the young rabbits that uh, uh, VHD1 uh, allowed to survive for some reason. So very contagious, very infectious, very easily spread predominantly via uh, live animals and fomites. As I mentioned before, we, um, we have seen uh, cases on islands which are not populated by, um, by rabbits. And in that case, we think it's predatory birds who've um, eaten rabbit carcasses that have, been, uh, that have died from RHD1. And the um, virus has passed uh, undigested through the digestive tract and been passed out either in faeces or potentially in uh, cast up pellets uh, containing fur and feathers and, uh, and bones and such like that would be a great route to, to spread it. Um, certainly direct contact, pretty much direct contact between rabbits and via um, conjunctival and respiratory secretions, uh, being uh, grooming each other, sneezing onto each other etc. Um, there's always questions about the airborne nature of the disease and while technically it is potentially airborne. That's airborne over very, very short distances. We're not talking about it going up into the wind and being spread uh, across um, uh, between different countries. We're talking about spread within a room, uh, within next door hutches, within next door um, enclosures, uh, where there's pretty much direct saturation of the air with uh, infected respiratory secretions. And the figure or root um, uh, contamination of litter trays where um, they're eating hay out of the, the litter tray, contamination of water drinkers and, and food bowls and bottles and so on. Um, there is this figure of, um, it, it definitely does seem to last longer in the wild in cold temperatures and we thought of RHD1 particularly as a, as, as a bit more of a winter disease. That seems less clear cut with RHD2, we're certainly still seeing it in the summer um, 
it seems to be relatively independent of season. But there is this figure of survival of the virus for almost eight months at four degrees centigrade in optimum conditions. And this is very much optimum conditions. This is um, being suspended in organic supernatant and kept in a fridge uh, at four degrees centigrade. This isn't necessarily mimicking a dead wild rabbit uh, carcass, but um, that would be probably the most um, uh, realistic optimum conditions that we might see and we can certainly imagine that lasting uh, in the animal for months. So we need to be cautious about making sure the carcasses are disposed of, that they're buried, they're incinerated, etc. as fast as possible so we avoid spread. Um, we talk about other uh, infectious diseases, um, <clears throat> other respiratory tract diseases apart from myxomatosis, which uh, has a respiratory component to it, uh, ecto and endoparasites, particularly talking about coccidia and uh, econuclei, a little bit on troponema. So, respiratory tract disease can be a one off rabbit uh, infection or it can be a group housed rabbit problem. Um, it's very common to see rabbits in rescues, in breeding situations, with quite a high burden of uh, respiratory tract problems. So, typically Pasteurella multocida, but um, we certainly see other uh, bacterial species involved um, uh, throughout um, all life stages of rabbits, with the younger rabbits probably being the, um, uh, the, the most commonly affected. It's not uncommon to see chronic nasal discharges in rabbits which have been relatively recently sourced from uh, uh, pet shops because um, the uh, bacterial disease has been uh, shared amongst the, the group. They've been immune suppressed through stress, through changes of diet, changes of uh, social grouping, movement around the countryside, and potentially sharing diseases from different uh, locations. So post weaning rabbits are at particular risk of this and particular risk of developing secondary problems with uh, GI motility and so on uh, as a result. We can uh, look in groups at uh, blanket treating them, perhaps on the basis of findings, laboratory findings, microbiological findings from either live or dead rabbits. Um, Post-mortem animals may uh, uh, um, give us information about um, the uh, type of infection present, the uh, diseases present and the uh, bacterial sensitivities that we've got, the antimicrobials that are most effective. We're limited in the usefulness of taking samples from live rabbits. Um, deep nasal swabs are required or um, tracheal washes or bronchiola lavage are, are needed to get representative samples. Uh, it's, um, it's very difficult to get a truly representative nasal swab without just getting a load of environmental pathogens from the outside of the nose or just inside the nose. So we can test, we can try um, uh, sort of first line medication treatments using uh, either licensed or suspected uh, effective antibi uh, antibiotics against those. And we may look at treating in contact, um, sort of metaphylaxis if you like, treating the, um, the animals which are at uh, uh, most risk within that subpopulation. Um, it's a bit more difficult to prevent spread than it is with cats. Um, cats with viral diseases can be singly housed behind uh, sneeze barriers and so on, so we can prevent or limit the, the spread of um, uh, bacterial disease and viral disease between cats. Rabbits, we're trying to keep them in social groups, so it's really difficult to, uh, uh, to keep rabbits in kind of sterile conditions separate from one another so that they, uh, they don't spread it without negatively affecting their behaviour. Um, the best we can do, perhaps, is to make sure that we have small groups and that they're in well ventilated uh, units. Now this is a, a little sort of um, uh, move around hutch and run combination so they're, um, they're able to move it to fresh grass so although it's not big enough really for this number of rabbits or any number of rabbits really at least it can be moved to fresh grass and we've got excellent ventilation through here which is going to uh, assist with uh, their recovery. Uh, it may be that we need to make sure that if there's a collection of rabbits, we keep, um, we barrier nurse them, we keep the uh, the infected ones in one closed airspace and we keep the uh, uninfected ones in a, a quarantine area or a separate uh, uh, space. It may be that we need to treat all the rabbits uh, that are in contact with any infected ones, not just treat the, the overtly clinically affected ones, and otherwise we run the risk of them just bouncing infection backwards and forwards between them. 
fogging environments with um, nebulised, uh, sort of industrial nebulisers, the kind of uh, machines that are used to fog chicken sheds, turkey sheds, etc. with uh, antiseptic products, disinfectant products, can be quite useful in reducing bacterial load and potentially humidifying the air, which uh, may just help break down some of the respiratory secretions and may help uh, give these rabbits some symptomatic relief. But a lot of this comes down to good ventilation, keeping them scrupulously clean, keeping the um, uh, the ammonia levels low. And remember that these rabbits are right next to the, the bedding, so they're getting quite a high intake of uh, ammonia if they're not uh, cleaned out uh, often enough. And potentially in large groups, uh, either breeding or rescue centres, thinking about taking out the, the worst affected animals who will have uh, perhaps badly compromised qualities of life as well, and uh, removing them from the environment, uh, euthanizing them to prevent spread to, uh, to the others and perpetuation of the problem. Ectoparasites, um, we don't tend to blanket treat uh, rabbits in the same way as we would dogs and cats against uh, predominantly fleas. The main problem we tend to see are uh, mites, um, uh, things like Caelitiella and, um, and other mite species, Soroptes, um, Canuculi, the uh, rabbit ear mite we see from time to time. We don't really consider that to be sufficient frequency and disease uh, severity to, to treat them sort of monthly with anti-flea products and uh, we're a little bit more limited in terms of what's licensed and what's potentially safe because Vipronil tends to be toxic to rabbits and uh, almost none of the products with the exception of imidacloprid are uh, licensed for rabbits. So if, you're, uh, if you have indoor rabbits who are in contact with cats or dogs and you particularly have cats who are flea allergic, you might be looking at treating the rabbit as one of the environmental hosts within the environment to make sure that uh, you, you kind of um, uh, address the life cycle of the flea and don't stop uh, and don't allow the fleas to just live on the rabbit and then jump off onto the cat. Um, Generally speaking, though, we'll just um, work on treatment if we see um, signs of disease rather than uh, prophylactic treatment. We could also potentially include um, fly strike uh, under ectoparasite burdens. And again, we probably want to look at rabbits who are prone to fly strike, who have mobility problems, who have secotrophic accumulation, who have urine scalding or dental disease, any of those things that prevent them keeping themselves clean around the back end. Um, and monitoring those closely and potentially treating those with preventative treatment. We don't tend to recommend treating rabbits routinely, uh, preventatively for fly strike, unless they fall into one of those categories. And if they do, there are products uh, designed to, um, uh, to inhibit growth of um, uh, maggots on, on the rabbit. Remember that uh, Caelitiella, infection of um, the shoulder blade area of rabbits with, um, with mites, is often a, a warning sign that that rabbit has mobility problems, that it can't turn its head, it can't stretch out its back, uh, it may have back pain, spondylitis, spondylopathy, etc. And so that's the sort of rabbit who's definitely going to uh, run a higher risk of getting fly strike in later life. So consider a kind of red flag for uh, other problems that might be related to mobility and uh, uh, teeth and digestive uh, tract health, etc. Endoparasites. Um, obviously, we're used to treating our pets for roundworms and tapeworms. Um, those are much, much less of an issue in rabbits. The only tapeworm infestation you tend to see is the um, uh, insisted form present under the skin or in the muscles or between muscle uh, bellies or inside the abdomen uh, as the uh, the insisted form uh, present in what is effectively an intermediate host, uh, the rabbit, rather than in the gut of our carnivore and um, omnivore uh, pets. We very occasionally see roundworms, they're not particularly pathogenic, they may just uh, in really high burdens cause problems but they're not really considered a, a huge health issue. Where we're more concerned is um, uh, treatment and testing for coccidia, treatment and testing for caniculi. So we don't tend to recommend routine worming, uh, although there is a, uh, a wormer in the form of fenbendazole, which is also effective against uh, E. caniculi. It's the E. caniculi we're usually using it for. So this would be a typical coccidia presentation. I used to think that coccidia was really just a disease of uh, farmed rabbits, uh, especially the youngsters, and that they developed uh, uh, immunity in later life and, and so on. And they were kept in lower stocking densities and kept uh, more um, sort of individually uh, um, in 
pet scenarios. But I've certainly seen coccidia in rescue rabbits who come from uncertain health backgrounds and may end up in relatively high stocking densities or with a continuous throughput of rabbits that makes it uh, difficult to kind of completely clean an environment, especially a run. So access to faeces that's over two or three days uh, of age can allow sporulation of the coccidia to take place and, um, and then to be ingested by the rabbit fecal orally and then um, uh, cause infection. And the typical signs are uh, sort of mucousy, uh, soft diarrhea, sometimes with some blood uh, present, uh, sometimes really watery diarrhea can be present. Um, and this is relatively easy to treat if we find it. It's a bit challenging to screen for it because there are about 20 something species of coccidia and some of them are completely non-pathogenic. Some are only pathogenic if they're present in certain parts of the gut and some are always pathogenic and they all look very similar. So we'd look at high numbers or species specific testing or uh, treating any uh, rabbit that appeared to have clinical signs consistent with coccidia. Um, if we clean these rabbits out every two to three days or at least remove the possibility of them uh, ingesting faeces which is more than two to three days old this should break the cycle so that in conjunction with treatment should be sufficient which brings us on to echinicula which is uh, a little bit more interesting a little bit more challenging and so on this is, is a disease uh, predominantly of the kidneys um, the um, uh, the organism lives in the kidneys, uh, forms, um, uh, uh, reproduces uh, in spore form, which is passed out in the urine, which is then ingested or inhaled by the rabbit and uh, reinfecting uh, other rabbits. It also affects the brain. Um, those spores can localise in the brain and they can um, uh, reproduce within cells of the brain and then uh, when the cell is, is literally full of infected material, that, uh, that cell bursts and spreads disease and also causes inflammation of surrounding uh, brain cells, so it can cause um, uh, brain lesions that way. So it tends to be a disease of the brain and the kidney. In the kidney, it's occupying parenchyma, it's damaging parenchyma, it's replacing it effectively with scar tissue and uh, causing premature aging of that kidney. So we can screen by clinical signs. This is a, a fairly typical uh, and almost pathognomonic uh, clinical sign, a head tilt. The only real differential for this in the UK, at least, is um, uh, an inner or um, middle ear infection or a combination of the two. And we can either rule out the ear involvement or we can positively diagnose echinicula or we can do both in order to decide what we've got going on here. Alternatively, we can test and we can see a response to treatment, but response to treatment uh, is, is really sort of uh, variable and individual uh, between rabbits. So I wouldn't consider an apparent successful treatment uh, to be conclusive proof that we had echinicula. It may just be that rabbit's improving over time. There are other manifestations of, of the disease. This is a, um, a slightly more unusual presentation. This is where in utero the rabbit is born, uh, it is infected, and then it's born with echinicle spores packing the lens. The lens is immunologically privileged. It can't be uh, acted upon by the, the grown rabbit um, until the lens ruptures through reproduction of these uh, spores in the cells and uh, bursting out uh, physically kind of exploding through the lens capsule and coming out into the anterior chamber. For some reason they always seem to come out into the anterior chamber not the posterior chamber and then they cause this nasty reflex uveitis that opens up the blood vessels to potential infection. We end up with um, uh, secondary bacterial infections or a raise in pressure of the um, anterior chamber to the point where that ruptures and uh, we get other infections coming in. The other differential for this, if we caught this early and we only saw the uveitis and the cataract and the uh, cloudiness of the lens and the ruptured lens um, would be um, if we didn't only saw it at this stage, it could still possibly be a penetrating injury that's, that's gone through the cornea into the anterior chamber. But those are less common in rabbits than they are in guinea pigs, uh, where they're much, much more common. So we can take blood and we can perform, uh, this is uh, just showing the lateral saphenous vein of the rabbit being raised. It's a nice vein, we can get two, three mils of blood out of that um, vessel, enough for hematology, biochemistry, and you can be serology. And we can carry out serology um, looking at IgG and IgM to, uh, to decide whether that rabbit's infected and whether it's been infected in the past week or so or the past month or so or, or longer. We can treat, we can um, uh, prophylactically treat these rabbits and um, that's a controversial issue because the drugs are not necessarily 
totally 100% benign in their effects. They may have side effects that cause problems. And we'd be treating potentially a lot of rabbits who have no E-caniculi if we were to, to just treat every rabbit that came through the door. On the other hand, this is a potentially very serious infection and the cost of, treat, uh, cost of testing can be quite considerable. So uh, some people will, will opt for semi-prophylactic uh, treatment of the, of the disease even without diagnoses. Um, another disease which we don't see that commonly, but it's worth mentioning because it's uh, an important differential for myxomatosis, is treponema. And here we have the typical uh, blistery um, sort of uh, swellings, uh, slightly moist swellings of the nasal philtrum, the upper lips. Sometimes we'll see it going into the, the corners of the mouth. Um, sometimes affecting the eyelids and often affecting the genitals because these rabbits are um, uh, performing cecotrophy, they're eating uh, uh, cecotrophs um, straight from the anus and they're potentially spreading treponema between the, uh, the face area and the genitals. So it can look particularly like myxomatosis because myxomatosis also cause gentle, uh, causes the gentle uh, uh, skin and mucosa to, uh, to become inflamed and uh, swollen. The good news is that treponema is very treatable. It can be treated with penicillin-based products, um, obviously making sure that we're not, um, uh, that we're warning people of the potential risks and maintaining gut health with probiotics uh, and uh, making sure they're on a good diet, ideally before we feed, uh, before we treat them, and not giving those penicillins orally where they're more likely to cause problems, but giving them uh, systemically. And we'll typically see a response to treatment within about three days uh, using uh, penicillins in these infected uh, rabbits. So that can um, uh, almost be diagnostic in itself, uh, response to treatment, rather than uh, performing uh, silver stains or dark field microscopy on, on samples or looking at serology, which can be a bit challenging. In its extreme cases, we can see these, these crusting lesions. And at this point, it's probably pretty clear it's not myxomatosis because we've got no secondary bacterial purulent material um, and we've got no... Um, uh, infection of the, the eye area. So at this point we can be a little bit more uh, clear, but in the early stages it can be a little bit difficult to tell the two diseases apart. So uh, treatment uh, can be um, in some ways the easiest way to tell. Ringworm tends to look less like um, myxomatosis, I find, than, um, uh, uh, than uh, treponema. It tends to be drier and more crusting, probably not as pruritic as it is in cats. Moderately common in, in rabbits, quite common in guinea pigs. Uh, and I would say most of the rabbit cases I've seen have been rabbits that have been housed with guinea pigs at some point or transported with guinea pigs and it's been spread between the, the two. Often related to immune state, uh, status, so if we get these rabbits into a good home, we feed them up properly, they're exposed to UV light outside, that does tend to help um, uh, cure them. And uh, as I say, it's usually a disease of um, pretty much of the environment of a poor start in life. These I would test because we're dealing with a, a potential zoonosis zoonosis and we're dealing with a potentially long treatment course so nice to get a, a, a diagnosis at the beginning so we know whether our treatment isn't working or we've uh, made a uh, we need to reevaluate our diagnosis better to get a diagnosis at the beginning thank you very much and um, hope you look uh, forward to the next one